everyone, and welcome to Yardstick Management's inaugural DE&I in Action virtual series. My name is Selma Shilbaya. I'm the Chief Communications Officer at Yardstick Management, where I have the honor to oversee all the internal and external communication strategy alignment, marketing, public relations, branding, and project management solutions for our global clients. I have spent most of my career in journalism and in higher education, where I've spent seven years at CNN covering international and domestic breaking news as a producer, assignment editor, and writer. I have also simultaneously taught at universities communication courses at a variety of them, including Georgia State University, Bernal University, and Clayton State University. In the past five years, I've also been running my own communication firm, helping clients um, with their branding by utilizing effective messaging, as well as differentiating them across platforms to deliver that message. And today, I couldn't have asked for a better space to be to elevate and amplify America's leading management consulting firm, Yardstick Management. And I am delighted to be your MC for today's episode of Elevating Black Business Women in Business. I mean, Black Women in Business. We welcome our viewers, including our clients and partners from all across the nation during the celebratory Black History Month. Thank you all for joining us. While we're waiting for everyone to join in the Zoom, we invite you to introduce yourself via Zoom chat. First, please make sure to change your two to be directed to all panelists and attendees. And please tell us your name, where you're Zooming from, and anything else you want to share with us relevant to today's conversation. We also want to encourage you to engage with us on social media throughout today's programming via LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Be sure to tag us on all your posts and use hashtag YSM virtual series and hashtag DEI in action. We also want to hear from you, so please use the Q&A section in the Zoom at the bottom of your screen to ask our panelists questions throughout the show. We also will be asking you a number of poll questions to participate in. And for your convenience and reference, we are including a link to today's program here in the chat, which you should have also received upon registration. So you could check it out for the schedule, the topic discussion, as well as full speaker bios that are included within. Now, let's get started. We have prepared a stellar lineup of Black women speakers who are game changers in the DEI industry, and they are joining us today to share their experiences and thought leadership on how to ensure Black women have the support and space to be authentic decision makers in business while adding the diversity that companies need for their own growth. These women have walked the talk adding DEI in the DNA of every organization they've touched, and we are incredibly excited to have them with us today. But before we bring them to the stage, we want to invite the man behind today's programming, the founder and managing partner of Yardstick Management. He has built a legacy of a management consulting firm, serving and impacting some of the biggest name brands in the world, such as Facebook, Netflix, Amazon, LinkedIn, Prudential, Metronic, and many more. Yardstick has partnered with over 100 companies, government agencies, and higher education institutions in the US, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East, and Africa. Dr. Ebby Parsons is a seasoned business executive with a passion for intentional impact, and he has been applauded for his strategic thinking, engaging leadership, and results orientation throughout his successful career. After working at Fortune 500 companies, including Intel, Medtronic, and American Express, Dr. Parsons made the decision to transition from a promising career in business in 2007 to educational leadership. Leveraging his wealth of experience and expertise in business and education, and with prompting advice from both his mother and wife, he launched Yardstick Management in 2012 with a vision to become a leader in transforming and impacting the global landscape of the management consulting industry. Less than a decade later, Yardstick has now become a world thought leader and powerhouse in providing specialized management, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, and talent consulting services to renowned mission-driven brands and organizations across the globe. 
Please help me welcome Dr. Ebby Parsons, who's going to speak to us today about the story of Yardstick. Ebby, please unmute, perfect. Thank you so much, Salma. And um, most importantly, thank you to all of our panelists and attendees. We are thrilled to, to be able to put on a platform such as this. Uh, and it's, it's truly at the core of what we do um, and what we are. Uh, this is and who we are as an organization. I, I actually am empowered by phenomenal black women and phenomenal black women are um, truly at the root of who we are as an organization and why we exist today. Um, brief history of Yardstick, myself, um, and kind of where we, where we all started. Um, I'm a native of Detroit, uh, the son of a small business owner, my dad and my mom was also a Detroit public schools teacher. And we, 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 we got the idea of um, building an organization based on just really how, how we were raised. It was all about equitable opportunities for all. Um, growing up in a city like Detroit, I was very fortunate, particularly um, being the highest percent, it, it was the blackest city in America. And everyone that I saw um, pretty much looked like me, whether I'm talking about the mayor or my, my pediatrician and doctors and lawyers to uh, other folks throughout the community. So there was, no, there was no shortage of seeing us elevated in every, every role across the city. However, when you think about um, my experience professionally, I had grown in my career to, to uh, points where, where it became many, it was the only, and it was, it was frustrating to see the only. And so as, as Selma mentioned, there were several pivots throughout my career um, from starting off as an engineer to getting into business, uh, post business school, um, to really focusing with the intent, with the intent focus and a ton of intentionality on what can I do to leave a mark that would ensure that more people that look like me had opportunities to advance in whatever field that they were in. And I, I remember, I'll never forget this. And that's why I said our, our founding is really rooted off, 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 off of the strength of strong black women. Um, when I read an article in USA Today, it ranked our nation's largest 50 school districts by graduation rate. And Detroit was unfortunately 50 out of 50, actually twice as low performing as the second lowest performing school district. And I called my mom and, and was frustrated. And she said, well, if, you're so if you're so frustrated about it, then do something. And that was the, the initial pivot to, to, to transitioning into a career in education. And as I worked in education, I was the COO of Hartford Public Schools in Hartford, Connecticut, CEO of a large uh, education management organization. And I thought that moving into education would allow me to see more people who look like me in my business career um, elevate to the top. But I quickly learned another statistic that was quite frustrating. And that was that the average white high school dropout would earn the actual, more, would earn more money than the average black college graduate. The average white high school dropout earned more than the average black college graduate. That statistic was beyond alarming. And again, another phenomenal black woman who's actually a panelist today, my wife, Ayana, um, I was really frustrated about that. And she gave me the charge. If you're so frustrated, then do something. And that was the founding of Yardstick. So we wanted to create an organization um, steeped and rooted in ensuring that there would be um, opportunities for advancement all the way at the C-suite and board seats um, for people who look like us, no matter what the field, no matter what the career. And I'm quite pleased and, and honored and just fortunate to be able to say that story of our founding has led to where we are today. And we're proudly to be, we're proud to be the nation's leading black owned management consulting firm, um, supporting organizations, many household names um, all around the world. So um, I just want to say thank you all because black women are at the root of our founding, they're at the root of who we are as an organization. And we firmly believe that if you get black women right, everybody else will, will, will move in the right direction because they, they have historically been the uh, most disadvantaged group. And I've got, you know, I'm excited to be able to just witness such a phenomenal group of the nation's leading black women thought partners. And we, we, we are true to our commitment at elevating black women because if we elevate black women, we elevate every single one of our organizations. So Selma, thank you so much for, for allowing me the time to speak. And I can't wait to hear what all the panelists have to say. Thank you, Abby. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Now we're going to move on forward with our first poll question for you all to participate in. So here it comes, it's about to come on and we'd love for you to make a selection. The poll question is, what do you think is the best way to be an ally 
to Black female entrepreneurs? Is it know the difference between real and performative allyship and practice the former? Take a step beyond mentorship and be a sponsor? Be an active bystander against microaggressions or use your votes and dollars to push for bigger policy and ecosystem changes. So we'll go ahead and let those results roll in. Take a few seconds to submit your response and let's see what we've got so far with the results. All right, all right, let's see. It looks like we've got the 54% saying, take a step beyond mentorship and be a sponsor. We'll let those results keep rolling in and we'll revisit them again uh, in just a little bit. All right, a USA Today analysis in 2020 shows of the top 279 executives listed in S&P, 274 are white, Hispanic, Asian, and other ethnicities. Only five represent black. Let that sink in, only five represent black. Less than 2% of top executives at the 50 largest companies are black. New Walgreens CEO, Roz Brewer, just became the only black woman chief executive at a Fortune 500. Today, stubborn patterns of exclusion and discrimination are still keeping black executives from reaching the top, despite the heights climbed by trailblazers, such as former Xerox CEO, Ursula Burns, the first black woman CEO in the Fortune 500, and ex-American Express CEO, Kenneth Chenault, who ran the credit card giant for 16 years. Too few black executives being groomed for key posts and too many corporations hunting for talent in all the same places. Here to speak with us today are two of a handful of black female leaders paving the way in these uncharted territories and the topic of diversifying the executive suite. Ayana Parsons is a senior partner in Corn Ferry's board and CEO practice with nearly 20 years of executive talent and leadership experience as both a practitioner and consultant. She currently serves a diverse client base of customer and consumer centric public and privately held companies, placing talented executives onto boards and, the in, and into the C-suite via CEO, president, and chief marketing officer's roles. In addition, Ayana leads Corn Ferry's global Power of All platform, which helps unlock and unleash the potential and power of all leaders by driving greater diversity and inclusion in the C-suite and boardrooms. Prior to Corn Ferry, Ayana served as the global head of retail, consumer goods, and lifestyle industries at the World Economic Forum, where she led the preeminent global discussions at Davos, Switzerland, on topics related to her respective industries. A seasoned industry executive, Ayana's career spans sales, marketing, and general management roles at several of the world's most admired companies, including Philips, Pfizer, Kimberly Clark, and Procter & Gamble. Ayana is also the wife of Dr. Ebby Parsons, confirming the saying that behind every successful man is a great woman. Tamika Curry-Smith is president of the TCS Group, a firm that provides human resources and diversity, equity, and inclusion solutions to a broad range of clients in a variety of industries. She was most recently vice president of global diversity and inclusion at Nike, where she was responsible for leading a global DNI team across the Nike, Jordan, and Converse brands. Prior to Nike, Tanika was head of diversity and inclusion at Mercedes-Benz USA. Miss Curry Smith has been featured at numerous publications, including Black Enterprise, The New York Times Magazine, Diversity Inc., and Diversity Professional Magazine. She has received various awards among them the Network Journal's 25 Most Influential Black Women in Business, Diversity MBA's Top 100 Under 50 Executive Leaders, and Arizona Business Magazine's 50 Most Influential Women in Arizona Business, and the Chairman's Award from the National Black MBA Association. Please help me welcome Ayana Parsons and Tamika Curry-Smith. Hello, welcome. Let's make sure our mics are off. <laughs> Hi, Thelma. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So excited to be here. Hello, hello. So let's go ahead and dig in. I'm so happy to have you both join us. Let's go ahead and dig in. I've got 
quite a few questions and I'm sure our audience will too. So Ayana, we'll start with your role at Corn Ferry. Speak to us a, a bit about what it entails and how you're helping um, the boards really get a grapple with diversity. Yeah, well, I will tell you, I have always been passionate about diversity and inclusion, particularly um, given the, the fact that I've, I've often been the only, um, and, and that starts at, at an early age, um, being in a gifted and talented program as the, as the only Black person, only um, Black girl in the room, and, and wondering why is this the case? And that that theme certainly holds true throughout my professional life. And, and I will tell you, because of that, I am laser focused on helping diversify um, the face of leadership at the highest levels. So the work that I do today is not just placing board directors or presidents or CEOs into their roles, um, but certainly when they are coming from um, underrepresented backgrounds or historically disadvantaged backgrounds, black and brown folks, let's be clear, um, then it takes more than placing them in the roles. You've got to make sure that these organizations, these boards, that they have inclusive cultures where uh, difference is valued, where diversity is celebrated, and where you can really get the most out of people. And so my role today is very much focused on that. And that's the essence of Power of All. It truly is about unlocking and unleashing the full potential of all people. And when we do that, it, it's a, a significant aspiration, but when we do that, the world is a better place and, and business is certainly a better place. What about you, Tamika? Speak to us a bit about your role and what it entails. Help us kind of get a, a good scope on and how you ensure that uh, you're helping executive suites um, you know, incorporate diversity. Thank you, uh, Selma and, and Ayana. So, so honored to be on this team with you talking today. Um, similar to Ayana's experience, most of my um, life growing up and certainly at college uh, and in the corporate environment has been one of a few, if not the only. And how I really, I would say I fell into DEI work originally when I was at Deloitte, um, which is where I started my career. And I eventually became their head of, of DNI for North and South America. But since that time, uh, as you said, when you introduced me, I've led DEI at, at several additional organizations and then also from the outside have consulted with dozens more, including colleges and universities. And I'm at the point in my life and in my career where I really want to have an impact and make a difference in the lives of others. That is why I do this work. And much of, of how I spend my time is consulting with C-suite leaders, advising them on the issues that really impact the progress that they say they want to make. I am a big advocate of, of walk the talk, don't talk about it, be about it. And so really sharing best practices and proven strategies to, as Ayana said, not only help them get diverse talent in their organizations, but more importantly, to elevate them, to promote them, and to retain them. Because oftentimes what we see is black and brown talent is brought into organizations, but they're not nurtured, they're not sponsored, the environments are not inclusive, and so we see this revolving door. So we really have to approach this work from multiple angles. It's not just about talent acquisition, but it's the entire employee pipeline that we need to be focused on. And you both are just, you know, a few of those who exist in this industry, just and also young. Ayana, yourself, you're one of the youngest in the industry in this specific role, uh, and the only one really in this role. And I, I'm really curious, I know you briefly touched on how you made it into this position, but give us a little bit more insight on how did you end up where you are today, ending up in this in this uh, decision making, but also almost like the, the pressure to make sure there's a lot of inclusivity and belonging for Black women. Sure, sure. Well, I, I would be remiss if I if I said that I had this all planned. Um, I, I certainly didn't, but I'm I'm honored to be in the position that I'm in today, where I can truly affect change. Um, the, I've always loved business, and, and I had the distinct pleasure of being part of a program um, the, the, the summer between my, my junior and senior year in high school, and it, it's called the LEAD program, Leadership, Education, and Development, and it was a program that, it, it, that exposed 
young um, underrepresented minorities to business. And I had the opportunity, I'm from Hot Springs, Arkansas originally, um, born and raised and very proud of that. And I had the opportunity to get on my first flight at the age of 16 and fly to Philadelphia and spend a summer at the Wharton School of Business and knowing nothing about business, but being incredibly fascinated with these business school professors and doing case studies. I mean, I fell in love um, with business. And, and I said, from that point on, as a young 16 year old, that's what I'm gonna pursue. I'm gonna pursue a career in business. And um, fast forward, had the opportunity to attend Florida A&M University under the leadership of, of Dean Sybil Mobley, may she rest in peace, but I mean, she was a pioneer for black people in business. And the School of Business and Industry at FAM is, is what really helped me blossom and grow. And, and it was at that point as a, a young college student that my aspirations were to be Fortune 5, first it was gonna be Fortune 500 CMO, and then I was gonna be a Fortune 500 CEO. And fast forward through a number of experiences where I was taking on marketing strategy, uh, general management and operating roles, but consistently facing, um, I think very real headwinds that black and brown folks face, um, you sort of get, you get a bit beat down. And, and I will tell you the turning point for me um, was when I was appointed the global head of retail and consumer goods for the World Economic Forum and had the opportunity to work alongside a number of CEOs, a number of board chairmen um, on macroeconomic issues that were facing the industry. And that renewed for me the sense of purpose that, you know what, um, there is a real possibility that more folks that look like me can get into the, the top job, the CEO job and onto boards. And so I was, you know, very, I'd say motivated to help make that happen. And fast forward, I've helped found um, two very successful social impact businesses. So from that standpoint, I got the CEO stripe. And today I am laser focused on making sure that young women, young men who look like me that do aspire to be CEOs, that do aspire to, to be on boards, that they can get there. Um, so that is, that's sort of my story and how I got here. But let me just say, you know, they, they talk about there's no such thing as luck. It is when preparation meets opportunities. And that's a common theme throughout my career. I've always prepared. I've always done the work. You work hard, you perform. But I've always thought about how do I try to make sure that I'm getting the right type of exposure, that, that I know what people are sort of saying about me when I'm not in the room, um, and that I, am, I, that, that I have folks that are advocating on my behalf. And I wouldn't be where I am today had it not been for tremendous sponsors throughout my career. And let me just say, most of whom actually don't look like me, um, that I would, that, that's, that's how I've gotten here. So hopefully that helps you understand a little bit more about my why, my story, um, and how I've sort of landed in this place. That's a, that's a great point to make, Iona, for us for perspective, like that allyship, right? That, that first book mm -hmm. about allyship, right? What do we do? And you mentioned sponsors and, and individuals who didn't even look like you. And now you're paying it forward to make sure that others get that same chance. Thank you for sharing that. To make Absolutely. That, Thank you. Can I talk a little bit about how you made it where you are? You are. I know you said you fell right into it. How is that mm -hmm. possible? Yes. Well, when I say I fell, I fell because uh, my undergraduate degree is in accounting. So if someone had told me when I was studying for the CPA exam that I would end up working uh, in, in human capital, HR and DEI, I probably would have told them they were crazy. Like Ayana, I had a, a love for business early on. Both of my parents uh, were entrepreneurs. And so I just grew up seeing them um, kind of hustle and embody, you know, what it means to be an entrepreneur uh, and a be, to be a Black entrepreneur and, and being successful. And I always loved math, so I kind of put math and business together and came up with accounting. But how I stumbled into DEI work is I was always the person at Deloitte. If you go back to, you know, early 90s, mid 90s, which is when I first started at Deloitte, 
not a whole lot of women, not a whole lot of, of people of color, certainly very few black people. And so I was always advocating for where are we recruiting and, and, and do we have HBCUs? And even if we weren't going to HBCUs, if we were going to predominantly white institutions, were we connecting with the organizations on campus that are focused on underrepresented groups? So I was always volunteering to be a part of the recruiting team, to be on the interview slate when people came to the office. And then similar to what I Yana said to be a mentor, a buddy, as people started at the firm, because like I said earlier, it's one thing to get people in the door, but it's another to keep them there. And so I think people just saw this natural inclination and passion that I had. Uh, and, and that's literally how I got offered my first role in DEI. But once I started doing this work, I absolutely loved it. I feel like it's not just my passion, but my purpose. And I think there are so many avenues that we all have to tackle to address this issue of inequity and elevating and empowering, uplifting the voices of people who are different. And so I've done that both inside of organizations, as you've heard, but also outside as a consultant. And um, I, I love what I do. Um, certainly wouldn't be here without a lot of mentors, a lot of sponsors. And and I when I tell people they need to put together their kind of board team on their own and that team needs to be diverse. It should include people that are like them, people that aren't like them. It should include um, both people within their organizations and people outside. We really, as I said, have to be multifaceted. We have to learn the real deal and the, and get the hard truths, um, but also have people advocating for us as well. So. Why do we think this is great, like uh, build up to my, my next question for, for both of you. Why do you think or why are there so few CEOs in particular, black female CEOs in particular in the Fortune 500? Maybe Ayana, we'll start with you. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons um, mm -hmm. to, to sort of unpack this, yeah. this issue, but, but at the core, I think this boils down to lack of sponsorship because the talent is there and we, I do a lot of work around CEO succession and when you think about CEO succession there is sort of the near term and the longer term succession and I would encourage anyone who is in a leadership role within their company to think about who is in that succession pipeline who's in that succession pipeline if it's zero to sort of three years out three to five even five to ten and I think not enough companies are, are taking a hard look at the pipeline and asking the difficult question. So if there aren't any black and brown people in the pipeline or women of color, why? Why not? Does the talent not exist within my organization? And if it doesn't, you got another problem. You need to fix mm -hmm. that. And if it does, why are these women of color getting stuck at certain levels and not being put forward for promotional opportunities. So to me, that is a, that is a major issue. I mean, companies are spending, we have clients that are spending upwards of 125,000, 150,000, even 200,000 for very intensive executive leadership development. We have something called our Executive to Leader Institute that is all about helping um, you know, top talent within organizations start to prepare for the top jobs. And we're doing a lot of work around making sure that we are asking the extra questions of our clients and making sure that that institute is, is incredibly inclusive so that once again, you can unlock and unleash the power of all people. But if you have a, a system and a process in place that is um, that in and of itself is systemic in nature and is creating many barriers to all of this talent being able to progress and move within the organization, that's a problem. And, and I will tell you, when I think about inclusion, I think about it on two fronts. There's sort of the behavioral piece, and that's why so many companies are doing unconscious bias training. We've, we've, uh, we've evolved to more conscious inclusion, and we do a lot of that at Corn Ferry. But then the balance of it is, how are you driving systemic change and really challenging your practices, your processes that are keeping people from advancing. And so that's why you gotta take a, a, a really hard look at recruitment practices. You've gotta look at per performance review practices, succession planning practices, and turn those things on their head. 
Um, so hopefully that helps you sort of understand, but all of this comes back to a lot of the systemic barriers that are in place that are preventing more folks that look like us from continuing to advance. Tamika, would you like to take a moment and, and, and address that question too? Thank you, Ayana. Yes, I mean, all, all of that. Um, and I, I mean, I just synthesize it as this, talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. If Love you it. go back to uh, when we all took statistics, those of us that did, and we had the bell-shaped curve, the fact that 93% of CEOs and Fortune 500 are white men could not even statistically be possible in a normal environment. So we know there is something going on. There is bias that is rampant in organizational systems. And so that systemic approach that Ayana pointed out is so key. Organizations have to really be committed to looking at all of their policies and practices, to seeing are the outcomes equitable? We know they aren't. So if they aren't, what are they going to do to truly dismantle the way that they operate now to infuse DEI into a new way of operating? And then to make sure that the whole organization is on board to move forward in that way. But then here's the piece, the piece that I think is absolutely critical is measurement and accountability. This is one of the few areas where half of the organizations don't even measure where they are when it comes to DEI. The half that do measure, there's absolutely no accountability if people miss their goals. Um, there's no transparency, so they, they don't even share the numbers. So that this whole ecosystem, DEI needs to be treated as any other business function where there's a, pan, a plan put in place, there are resources provided for it, and then people are held accountable and there are consequences if they miss their goals. So this is when I talk about walking the talk. That's how you get more diversity in the executive suite is you make a commitment, you put the entire weight of your organization as a CEO, as the executive team behind it, and you hold people accountable until progress is made. Two, for too long, we have prioritized comfort over progress. And that's why progress has been so um, slow, quite frankly. We have a variety of, of attendees who are listening to us right now, some of which are decision makers and some of which are really coming on board to be inspired by both of you in, in your leadership positions and, and hope to, to reach that level at some point. So we've got a, a question here actually from one of our attendees who's um, addressing Ayana, but I think for both of you, this could be a, a good question. Can you address self-empowerment? Many of us suffer from the imposter syndrome from time to time. You come from a place of power and confidence. What tips do you have? Yeah, um, I think in frameworks. And so the, the first, um, if I think about just a, a, a framework, it would be um, first you got to believe it. And, and that comes from within and doing the work to believe that you are capable, to believe that you are smart, and to believe that you can get there. And, and again, that is inner work. But once you believe it, you need to surround yourself. And I love what Tamika said earlier with your own personal board of directors that is gonna be incredibly diverse. And you need to speak your aspirations to those folks who are going to support you, this board of directors. So you first believe it, then speak that truth and you let them know what your goals, what your aspirations are so that they can help support you to get there. But that is the first step, believing it. Then it's sort of, dreaming it in terms of the, the sort of the possibilities. And then ultimately you gotta do the hard work to achieve it. But when it comes to, to frameworks, that is one that, that I just, I live by. And I will tell you this work of having sponsors who will create opportunities for you, who will work tirelessly behind the scenes and in front of the scenes on your behalf, that is an incredible piece of the puzzle to ultimately help elevate yourself and get there. But I will tell you, as a woman, um, we, we talk about this a lot, imposter syndrome is real. And that is where having networks of, 
of other um, executives, of other middle managers, of, of just other peers mm -hmm. that you can support and that can support you in that, you have to have these types of groups and sort of advocacy groups. So I would seek those out if there are employee resource groups or, or business resource groups within your organization, or even just creating that on your own, make sure you've got that network. Yeah, I'm a big framework person too, Ayana. I think it comes from being in professional services firms. We're surrounded by frameworks. And I would say, I would say a, um, an equation that has worked for me is performance plus relationships equals opportunity. So I think first and foremost, we've got to perform. Like you need to be not just good, but great at what you do. Know your business, whatever that is, your function, your role inside and out and also be looking for how you can continue to add value. We also have to build relationships across the organization. The way that I've gotten to where I am is, is through people that I've known, and I've genuinely approached this, this process of building relationships. And so what happens is what Ayana said, people know about things when I'm not in, even in the room, and they bring those opportunities to me. And then here's what I found that has happened. When I know I know what I'm doing and I feel confident in my skills and abilities, when I have the network of people who are speaking on my behalf and mentoring me and sponsoring me, I then get those opportunities. I'm in those rooms and I'm thinking, I'm just as good, if not better than the other people at the table. And so it's, it's almost like a, a, a machine that gets fed. The more that you do the performance, the more that you build the relationships, the more opportunities you get. And then the confidence gets built because you realize you deserve to be at the table. You yeah. add value, sometimes more value than the people who've been there longer than you have. And so I, I think you're right, Ayana. We have to believe it. But then once we achieve it, get in there hold our place at the table with confidence, and then more importantly, empower others and make sure that they get a seat at the table too. So I think it's an evolution. It comes from really putting in the work and starting to know that you are just as capable and competent as others. All that we need to do is crack that opportunity nut and the doors will open. I love that. I love that. It made me think of, um, uh, a sort of a formula that I learned pretty early on in my career. I was at PNG at the time and it's called the PI model. And the P stands yes, for performance, yes. mm -hmm. the I is image, and the E is exposure. And the more senior you get in your career, the less it's about performance because performance is table mm -hmm. stakes. You're gonna mm -hmm. perform. That's it becomes right. about your image. Again, what do what are people sort of saying about you? What image are you projecting to the world? And then it becomes about exposure. And there's good exposure, there's bad exposure, but making sure that you're getting exposure to the right um, decision makers, influencers for your career. That is that is excellent advice. I love that pie. I love that. that that's, a, that's a really great takeaway for all of our audience to kind of lean in on. We have one minute left, but I really want to make sure we get to also giving some great advice for those of us joining us at the executive level who are the decision makers at companies who may perhaps be some of our partners with Yardstick or potential partners. So what, what advice would you give them, uh, and let's say in a sentence or two, to empower more Black women to become part of the executive suite successfully? Tamika? Yeah, I mean, the reality is when you look at all the statistics, uh, women of color are at the bottom in terms of opportunity and in terms of representation. So, you know, I say that there, I use uh, this uh, here, here's another framework, but uh, I call it the three I's, intention, integration, and investment. So organizations have to be intentional. This does not happen on its own. You have to really make a commitment and then go after it, like I said earlier, really mobilizing your resources to make this happen. Uh, integration is what I said before, really dismantling your inequitable systems and integrating DEI into how you operate, both from a people perspective and a business perspective. And then last is investment. Invest in your women of color, invest in your black and brown talent. That means developing them. That means sponsoring them, 
and having very formal programs. That means having mentoring programs. That means having a separate succession and destination planning process where you're mapping out their career, understanding what the gaps are to get to the C-suite, and then intentionally putting together a plan for that. So I would say the three I's are a really great way to move the needle and to not just say you want this to happen, but put the resources behind it to make it happen. I love it. And and I, so Tamika, I, I mean, I couldn't have said it any more beautifully. And I love the three eyes. I'm going to take that with me as well. <laughs> and I'll, I'll even I'll probably just simplify it even more. If you are on a board, if you are a CEO, if you are in a C-suite for any leadership role, and you are not a person of color, you need to be intentional and sponsor at least one person of color, but certainly more. And if they can be a black woman or a woman of color, even better, because as you know, women of color are the most historically disadvantaged. And when we talk about sponsorship, I'm not talking about mentorship. Mentorship, right. is, people of color are over mentored and under sponsored. Sponsors create opportunity. Mentors sort of give advice. Great. We need that too. But I'm talking about someone who can change the trajectory of your career. We need more sponsors. So that's my advice. Thank you both. This this has been great. We can we can talk all day, I know. And we've got other panels. I can't believe it, it flew by the 25 minutes. But I want to thank you, Ayana. I want to thank you, Tamika, so much for taking the time and spending the energy and sharing your experience and advice with our attendees. Thank you all. And I also want to uh, point out that we've got several questions um, still left in the Q&A section. We are keeping track of those questions and we'll facilitate with the speakers and we'll get back to you all uh, via email once we're done with the programming. Thank you again, Ayana and Tamika. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, now we're going to take a moment to reflect on the previous poll and introduce a second question for you all. So let's have a moment and revisit that first question we asked. What do you think of the is the best way to be an ally to black female entrepreneurs? It looks like we're still at the 54%, which is more than 50% uh, of taking a step beyond mentorship and be a sponsor. And that really aligns with what we just heard from our panelists in this first panel discussion. Now for our second poll question, so get ready to go ahead and um, make your selection and submit that. When women are finally given a chance to prove themselves in a senior position, they are handed something that is already broken and where the chances of failure are high. This is known as the glass cliff. What level of leadership have you seen this happen in before? The C-suite, the vice president uh, leadership, the managerial role, or an entry level position? So go ahead and start submitting in your answers and we'll get a preliminary look at those results. All right. And please continue to uh, submit any questions for us through the Q&A instead of the chat as well. This is just a reminder before our next poll. Let's have a look at the preliminary results for this one. All right. It looks like 53% have seen this phenomenon of a, a glass cliff at the vice president leadership position. We'll revisit this again as people continue to uh, submit their answers. For our next panel, uh, we have, uh, I wanna share some, some data with you all before we move into it. According to data from Lean In in 2020, when looking at the total workforce in the US, black women account for 7% of the population but they make up 12% of minimum wage earners. Of the C-suite leaders today, 21% are women and just 1% are black women. All of this is despite the fact that 75% of black women view themselves as very ambitious towards their career with 40% hoping to make it to a management position within the next five years. This is according to CNBC and SurveyMonkey's women at, um, uh, this is a poll uh, for CNBC and SurveyMonkey Women at Work survey that was released last year. 
This means that regardless of a Black woman's desire to advance in her career, there are seemingly insurmountable barriers ahead of her that make it harder to reach the top. So our next panel will address leadership growth and upward mobility for Black women. LJ Lewis is Vice President of Global Talent Acquisition, Inclusion and Diversity at WeWork. After joining the company in 2019, she designed the company's global inclusion and diversity strategy centered on four pillars, talent attraction, engagement, development, and advancement. In her role, LJ leads talent acquisition, executive recruiting, employer branding, and campus recruiting, as well as WeWork's Office of Inclusion, which manages the company's Global Leadership Diversity Council and five employee affinity networks. LJ received a master's degree in human resources at New York University. She earned a bachelor's degree in business administration with a dual concentration in finance and management at Georgetown University. Trina Scott is chief diversity officer for Rocket Companies, the nation's largest mortgage lender. In this role, Trina develops the strategy and infrastructure that fosters a culture of equity and inclusion leveraging the diverse perspectives of her team members. She's passionate about people and creating a work environment that is grounded in collaboration and freedom of self-expression. She also connects Rocket Mortgage and the entire Rock family of companies to its local communities by helping attract, engage, and develop top talent. Trina joined the Rock family of companies to lead the diversity and inclusion team in early 2017. She has spent her previous 10 years with a public accounting firm that focused on the company's corporate social responsibility efforts. While she was there, she launched a youth mentorship program centered around college access in 30 plus US urban cities. This helped more than 1000 young people get accepted to college. Welcome LJ and Trina. Hello. Hi, thanks for having us. Thank you so much for joining. So excited to speak with you. And we've got Trina, hello. Hi, hi, good to see you. And man, it's such an honor to follow Ayana um, and Tamika and just uh, really excited to be here. Thank you to Ebby Parsons, my friend from Detroit. What up though? And to all of the people that are here, I wouldn't greet you right if I didn't say that. So I'm sure Ebby is smiling right now. <laughs> he just wrote you in the chat, of course. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm honored to speak with both of you, and I really want to just start diving in because there's always so much content to cover. So, LJ, maybe you can give us a little bit of, of input and insight on your role as VP of Global Talent Acquisition, Inclusion and Diversity at WeWork, and how, your, uh, how you ended up reaching this position. Sure, sure. So, I loved Ayana's uh, reference to lead, and, and I'll just ping uh, Inroads. So, uh, I was an Inroads intern. Uh, for four summers in the Atlanta affiliate, so all the ATLians out there. And really that positioned my career and gave me access to, uh, to corporate America. So uh, unlike many interns, uh, I actually had three sponsoring companies over four summers. So my first sponsoring company was Lend Lease Real Estate Investments. My second was Bank of America. And my last was GE. And that really positioned me um, kind of being at Georgetown, but being in these multiple corporate environments uh, to get where, um, where I am today. So I studied finance, uh, went directly into private equity, um, where, you know, of course, uh, not, not only the only person of color, um, but, but one of, you know, two or three women that were actually um, on the investment side of, of my private equity firm. And then over the years, uh, kind of fell into human capital like many of us do, um, because I was at a company that had a change of control and uh, I'm also a Corn Ferry alum, started doing executive recruiting uh, and diversity at Corn Ferry where I was for six years, and then got into, uh, into L Brands uh, where I was focused on working uh, at the executive level, recruiting, talent development, talent management, succession planning. Um, and that got me to WeWork. Uh, so I took over executive recruiting uh, and then really in, in, our, um, in our efforts to, to go IPO, started looking at culture uh, really intently um, and uh, ended up taking inclusion and diversity on global talent acquisition as well. 
the best part of my job is I always think about accountability. And as, as DEI professionals, we really are in many cases uh, influencers of the outcome, um, but, but don't really kind of have that, uh, that, that accountability for, for the results uh, when it comes to especially recruiting. So what's great about my job is I'm responsible for the DE&I strategy, but I'm also responsible for getting people into the company and retaining our top talent regardless of uh, if they're women, people of color, et cetera. So that's just a little bit of uh, how I got into my current role. I love it. Your role is quite comprehensive to ensure it stays intact. I love that. What about you, Trina? Please share with us more on your role at Rocket Companies and what it entails and how you ended up in this uh, position. Yes. Um, you know, I think that I have to start back to, and I, I think Tamika said this too, um, the early in my journey and LJ, you as well. I have a finance degree. I'm actually a certified fraud examiner. And so, <laughs> so I started my career um, in healthcare um, and uh, really honing the skills of understanding business, complex business um, um, you know, functions and processes um, as an, an auditor. And then um, I got laid off twice in my career. And uh, you know, my parents both were at their respective organizations for 30 plus years. And so um, by not happenstance, but because I feel like everything happens for a reason. But my mentor at the time, Bridget Kennard, uh, who was a member of the National Association of Black Accountants, um, and Bridget's way said, girl, get your suit on and bring as many resumes as you can. And I said, okay. And so we went to a conference and uh, the last, it's the true story, the last company that I came across, uh, which is now Merck. Uh, the, at the time they were called Shearing Plow, Merck bought Shearing Plow. Um, I, I met a woman who just started talking about her experience, um, her experience as um, an, an internal auditor, her experience both globally and um, you know, from a US standpoint, and it, it, it intrigued me. And so um, you know, I found myself moving to New Jersey after growing up in Detroit. Um, and going to school in Detroit. Um, and it was a whole new world for me. Um, I had a chance to work in 14 different countries, um, had a chance to live abroad. Um, and it just expanded my uh, scope of, of influence and also experiences. Um, and so when I moved back to the States, because I lived in Puerto Rico for two years, helping to implement compliance requirements uh, for the organization, um, I found myself at a crossroads of like, what was I going to do you next? And so I ended up working for Ernst & Young um, and I started in a very niche practice, um, fraud investigation and dispute services, say that 20 times. But uh, so, you know, it was a really small practice. There weren't many people who looked like me, especially when you think about life science, fraud investigation and dispute services, even more niche. And uh, my goal was to be the first black woman partner in Detroit for the firm. And, um, and at that point in my life, I had checked every box. I had checked the box of uh, finishing college. I played basketball in college. I checked that box. I finished uh, the box of you know, uh, starting my career and moving on and working globally. And then I checked the box of being married and then I had a child. And uh, my husband and I checked the box of being parents. And low did I know that uh, a year and a half into her little life uh, that she was born with a really rare condition and we almost lost her. And um, I'm so thankful uh, that she is still here, but it changed my perception about my career. I stopped trying to be something that I didn't see. And I started to focus in on the things that I was passionate about. And I call it finding your jam. And so I was in search of my jam and what would get me up every day on those tough days? What would I do? So I essentially quit the firm. And it was a partner uh, that um, put me aside, a white partner. And he said, um, Trina, I, I think you need to go and take some time and get your daughter well. And I, I'm glad I did. And she's 12 now. And I'm very thankful for that. But when I came back, uh, I said, I still quit. And he was like, <laughs> I really need your help in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I honestly answered him. And I said, I don't know much about that other than I'm a Black woman. Uh, and that's about <laughs> all I know in this space. And he was like, well, clearly, we don't have it solved. Um, I, would, I would argue that the firm had a has and still continues to have a center of excellence around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so I rolled my sleeves up. I applied 
all with principles of being an investigator and an auditor and just curious and asking a lot of questions and really digging into processes. And we've talked about that a lot, but in order to have change, you have to eradicate where there are inequities in the process. And then you have to bring people along and hold them accountable in that. So uh, getting that opportunity was phenomenal for me because it gave me a chance to, to marry the things that I love to do, help uh, young people um, at the same time be able to make an impact that directly um, I could see. And so, um, you know, that led me to leading corporate social responsibility where I'd met Ebby and Yardstick Management uh, on uh, building out a program um, that I had the pleasure of, um, of helping to build out with Deborah K. Holmes, who uh, recently passed away. And she taught me so much about what it was to be a leader. Again, a person that didn't look like me, but someone who was truly successful. And so, um, you know, in between all of that, being on boards and uh, meeting people and continuing to network, um, I met someone who worked for Dan Gilbert, who was the founder and chairman of Rocket Companies. And uh, he kept telling me about what Dan was doing in the city of Detroit. And Dan made the, um, made the decision to move from uh, arguably uh, the least diverse city in Michigan, Livonia, to the most diverse city, Detroit, um, 10 years ago, making this bold commitment of, you know what, we're going to help to support the change that is happening. And so I was seeing all these things externally, but I was trying to figure out really what, what it was all about. And so when this role came up, um, I, um, I had three <laughs> questions that I asked and I was just very curious and I wasn't looking for a job. Uh, fortunately, I've never had to look for a job except for that one time that I described. But I, I asked questions like, you know, why now? Uh, why do you want to have a role of diversity, equity, and inclusion four years ago? Um, um, what does that mean to you as an organization? And it came back to this whole principle um, of what we call the isms. And there are 20 principles, simple things like do the right thing, we are the they. Um, uh, and how did those things play out? So it was, it was very rooted in this deep, rich culture that Dan had created that it, it aligned and I could see myself there. But I also, I mean, data don't lie. Uh, <laughs> when you start to unpack the data and you start to look at the data, you say to yourself, okay, we have some work to do. So I landed in this space, um, fortunately, because of the things that I had to reorient from a personal perspective, but also because I really was focusing on, on making an influence and an impact as opposed to trying to be something that I didn't see. I love your story, Trina, and I, I'm, I'm seeing the chat. I mean, it's on fire right now. Everyone is loving your story. I think it's, you, you've shared quite a lot and, and, and finding that perspective, finding your jam, and, and it's really empowering and inspirational for our viewers here to hear that and kind of remain authentic to themselves and figuring out what they want to do. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I've got quite a lot of questions, but our, our time is running. I want to ask you both to really speak to us about perhaps maybe the number one hurdle that you had to overcome um, on your, your growing path, uh, whether it be through a company that you're working at, at or maybe just a, an individual level on a personal level that you had to overcome to push yourself forward into a leadership role. Uh, LJ, we can start with you. Sure. Um, and I think that this is the, the finance person in me, but, but wanting to check every box, right? So you see a new opportunity and it says, you know, 10 to 15 years of experience. It says, you know, let a team of over 20. It says this, that, and the other. And, and, and I, I don't know if it's, you know, being a woman and saying, I want to make sure that I check every box before I put myself forward, before I promote myself, before I kind of go out on that limb. Um, and that, that, you know, I think held me back in the early days. And essentially, you know, when I, when I kind of got to the table, it's, you know, people want people who are bright, smart, innovative, uh, and you get around that table and you think you're trying to kind of size people up and LinkedIn helps you a lot more. It's like, well, this person doesn't have 10 years of experience and this person hasn't led a team this big and this person, you know, hasn't lived uh, abroad, but they have no problem, you know, promoting themselves and putting themselves forward. Um, and it might be the Southerner in me too that you know wants people to speak for me and and not you know kind of be out front. I'm terrible on social media for that, and I still get a little anxiety. But really overcoming that and owning um, that you perform, that you are bringing something to the conversation, 
um, and, and know that most other people aren't you know, taking everything and checking every box before they put themselves out there. So put the boxes aside, don't, don't, don't worry about the boxes. Uh, if it's something that you wanna do and, and, and you feel like you um, have a chance at, you know, go for it, be, be a self-promoter. I love that, be a self-promoter, I love that. <laughs> Trina, what about yours? What was that number one hurdle for you? Um, you know, I'm gonna go back to my EY days. Um, I, you know, moved from client serving, which is revenue generation to non-client serving. Um, and sort of the back end office components. And that meant that, um, you know, I had to take a step back um, because either you are making money for the firm or you are, <laughs> you're, you're draining it, right? Or you're, you're, you're an expense, it, right? let's say that, yes. <laughs> Thank you, LJ. <laughs> um, and so that was a big, bold move for me. And I didn't realize um, what I was doing for myself. And I don't mean to sound braggadocious, but it was that, that small incremental back step that I took that I didn't know that that would lead me to where I am today. And so again, I attribute that to people who I surrounded myself with of being honest with me and not sugarcoating things. I promise I will try not to use cuss words, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> but, but I had people who were honest. I remember I, I interviewed 19 times when I was at the pharmaceutical manufacturing company for a sales role. And someone finally told me, you know what? You don't like rejection. And in sales, you, <laughs> you have to be able to overcome you know, rejection. And I was like, wow, that was painful, but thank you. And so, you know, so I've, I've, I've learned to surround myself with people who are not just gonna yes me and give me real honest advice. And so when I found myself at a crossroads um, of just trying to figure out what's next or if I had the right tools to do it, um, you know, I just went to those people who I knew would be honest with me and tell me the real and then honed in on the things that I was really good at and not worry about the stuff that I wasn't like, you know, I'm a strategist um, I have I'm a visionary, but the talking tackling and blocking and you know X's and O's that's not my jam so I surround my people with myself with people who do that. I recognize where my strengths are and I also recognize where my weaknesses are. And instead of dwelling on those weaknesses, I surround myself who can give me that strength to get through and power through those weaknesses. And so it goes back to the adage of NABA, the National Association of Black Accountants, lifting as you climb. And so as you're lifting, who helps to keep you climbing? And as you climb, who are you helped to lift? So that's how I look at overcoming barriers. And the last thing I'll say, because I'm a former athlete, and I'm sure that Abby would appreciate this. Um, in the middle of a pandemic and racial uprising last year, and we're still in all of that, and we went public last year um, as well. So we had all these things that were happening as a company. You know, sometimes your confidence gets shook. And I remember reading this from Michael Jordan. He said, I believe every time out, I was the best. And the more shots I hit, the more it reinforced that. So when you miss, because no matter how great you are, you will miss, you don't waver because you built yourself a nice little cushion of confidence. So that's what I kind of hold on to when I find myself a little shook or where I find myself like, ah, I don't know. I hold on to, you know what? I've got a, I've got a, I've got this thing down. Now let me re, let me reevaluate where I am and how do I push forward? I hope that answered your question. Absolutely. And I love your point on strengths too, identifying those strengths and and weaknesses and amplifying the strengths, right? And holding on to that. I love that. Absolutely. We've got one, one more minute, but I want to make sure that we address also our decision makers in the room and perhaps um, give them your words of wisdom and, and advice on how they can ensure that Black women have the space to grow and take on leadership roles in their companies. What advice would you have for them, LJ? Well, um, you know, I always say you can't manage what you don't measure and you know, knowing your numbers, right? Um, so, so many people um, in, in, a, in a sea of sameness, the, the people who are unlike stand out. So there's this like complex that like, we're not doing that bad, right? So it's, it's it, what are your numbers? And when you look across your organization, if, those numbers are really telling you a very different story than your perception. It's really kind of how do we kind of meet people where they are and make them feel included. 
So I always say, um, when I got to WeWork, uh, I, I didn't ever think about not showing up as my authentic self, but it is clearly an environment that allows you to be you. And that goes a long way with the number of black women. I wear my hair natural. I, I go to work comfortable <laughs> and, and, and look, it goes, it, it just really helps your psyche when you, when you go in and you know, people are there looking at you, accepting you for where you are. So if you do have those nuances in your culture that might be a gating issue where people don't feel like they are, you know, putting on their work face, you're not going to be able to retain people um, over, over the long term. So I, I go back to culture. I know people had other, other um, answers to this question, but really kind of check your culture and see how people feel and what can you do to open the aperture there. So that that kind of culture fit doesn't mean that others are excluded. Love that. I love that. Trina. I'm going to be really quick, uh, but LJ said it right. You have to start with the culture. The I is so important. Before you get to the E and the D, you must focus on inclusion because you can bring in great talent, but that talent will leave you just as fast as you brought it in. So I'd say to organizations, and this is what we're working on, you know, we're not perfect. We're not striving for perfect for perfection. We're striving for progress and we're striving for performance because that's why we exist as a company. We're here to perform in bottom line. And so thinking about what the culture looks like, not just how it plays out in surveys, but really digging deep and asking those questions that are important, um, extrapolating the data to not just look at it as an aggregate, but looking at it by dem different demographics. Look at the intersectionality of not just male and female, but you know, women of color and uh, looking at, you know, other aspects, tenure, looking at age, those components are super important. And if we all want to stay in business, it's imperative that we do it, because I'll leave you with these statistics that organizations who are inclusive are two times more likely to exceed financial targets. I think all of us want to do that. Three times more likely to be high performing. Yes, we do want to have high performing teams. Six times more likely to be innovative and agile. Well, of course, nobody wants to be the blockbusters of the world. And then eight times more likely to achieve better business outcomes. That is the reason why we're doing it. It's not the nice thing to do or the hot topic. If you want to stay in business or you want to stay relevant, then it behooves you to make this a business imperative. So I appreciate the opportunity to share my perspective and my story. Thank you so much, Abby and the Yardstick Management team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trina. And thank you so much, LJ. This was thank a you. Awesome conversation. Really appreciated your perspective. Thank you both. All right. We are on to our final poll question um, before we get into panel number three. So our question for you is, marketing powerhouse Bazoma St. John said, we need to show up. There's too many times when you've worked on a project and your colleagues are using we, we, not, uh, no, not we, it is I. What can we do to elevate the voice and brand of women in leadership? And your options are, be intentional about the day-to-day -day interactions with women, create leadership opportunities tailored with women in mind, expand the networks that enable women to lead or put women in leadership roles to make decisions that impact them. So we'll read, let those uh, responses roll in. Go ahead and submit your responses and we'll check out what they are as they're rolling in. Give you a couple seconds. I just want to point out again, I know we've got several uh, questions in the Q&A section that we will be facilitating with our panelists and we'll make sure to get you those responses after our event. Let's take a look at our responses for this poll question. All right, looks like at 72% believe that we must put women in leadership roles to make decisions that directly impact them. All right, so we have been looking at ways companies should diversify their executive suite, as well as how they can incorporate and elevate black women in leadership roles. But how do we ensure women establish a synchronous company brand while also staying true to their own authentic professional and personal narrative? How do we encourage 
promote and support Black women to feel engaged in genuine ways that speak to their values and needs of belonging. The balance is often a challenging endeavor to strike. Our next speakers will delve deeper into the topic of authentic voice and brand recognition for Black women in leadership. Dr. Atira Charles has been CEO of the Charles Consulting Group, a boutique consulting firm focusing on issues of diversity, inclusion, and wellness. As of November 2020, she has joined the executive leadership team of Moet Hennessy as the head of inclusion, diversity, and equity of North America. She is thrilled to make the shift to shape, direct, and transform the DNI strategy of this global organization while also contributing to the goals of the parent company, Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy Group. Dr. Charles' research has been published in numerous academic journals and media outlets, and it has been presented internationally. She has worked with many global Fortune 500 organizations, exploring the role of identities in the workplace. She is also a TEDx speaker and has an insightful talk entitled, Rethinking Diversity and Inclusion as a Health Dilemma. Her work has been featured in magazines such as Black Enterprise Magazine and Essence, she has also been the recipient of numerous awards, such as the Florida State University Guardian of the Flame Award and the FAMU Outstanding 125 Alumni Award. She was even nominated by the Obama White House as a change maker for the 2016 State of the Women's Summit. Organizations and collaborators speak very highly of our ability to impact the cognitive processes of employees in order to promote their psychological and behavioral change. Sharika Nelson has over 20 years of experience in human resources, specifically talent acquisition and diversity and inclusion. She is a seasoned executive leader with a unique ability to translate business goals into people strategy. Her work focuses on driving for innovation through creating organizations that reflect the different perspectives and communities of the world while actively working to be inclusive and equitable. She has led talent organizations for several global Fortune 500 organizations and is recognized as a results-oriented thought leader in diversity, inclusion, senior leadership coaching, employee engagement, and analytics. She also provides direct consulting support to organizations and individuals through Intentional Impact Group. She joined Coursera as the organization's first global head of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in this role, she will partner with executive leadership and the organization to develop and implement change by ingraining diversity, equity, and inclusion in all business goals and strategy. Welcome, Atira and Sharika. Thank you for joining us. Thank Hello. you for having us. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So excited to see you both. Uh, I want to kind of dig in right away and get to know a little bit about your roles. So we'll start with you, Sharika. Please share with us a little bit about what your role entails and how you reach this position. Thank you. Um, today has been such an amazing wealth of magic that has been brought to life. So I am excited for the conversation. Excited to see you, Atira. I haven't seen you in a long time. I know. Um, <laughs> so in my role, I like to say my work is really about changing systems. It is really focused on dismantling, disrupting those norms that have not worked for many. And as I think Tamika referred to, has kept the, those that have been comfortable, comfortable, comfortable for far too long. So I focus on sort of the spectrum of work of education, awareness, and understanding leading into behavior change and modification, and then impacting business decisions. I really strive to make sure that when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging, that what we're doing is weaving this work into the core DNA of an organization and how we approach our business goals and objectives. So shifting the focus from thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion as the problems we are trying to solve but instead thinking about our work as the solutions and the solves to the business problems that we are seeking to change. Um, I started my work as a recruiter. So my focus has always been about talent and creating opportunity um, and creating space. I uh, don't think about it as giving voice to people because people come to the table with a voice. 
Instead, my work is about creating space at the table for those voices to be heard. And I've spent the last 21 years working on talent strategy, working on talent acquisition, uh, focusing on retention strategies. I think there's been a theme today, especially for the current state where there's a lot of excitement around recruiting black and brown talent. We also have that, have that same level, level of energy around retaining, growing and developing that talent within organizations. And that's where I really think my focus has been, particularly over the past, I'd say maybe seven to 12 years. Fantastic, thank you for sharing that experience with us. Atira, please let us know a little more about what your job entails and how you reach this position. Sure, hi everybody, good to see you. Um, I first have to say, you know, Sharika and I actually met as a client and a vendor before a couple of years ago um, with a tech company. And so when we saw each other on the email list and text list, that was awesome. And I think that just speaks to literally like why we're having this event, right? Those black women in this field, we all are just a half a degree of separation, mm -hmm. um, especially those of us that have been in this work for a long time. So it's a pleasure to be in this space and see the both of us where we are now. So claps and kudos to you, Sharika. Thank um, you. <laughs> so I'm Dr. Tira Charles. Um, my road to the diversity C-suite space was a little bit non-traditional. So when I came out of school, I went to Florida A&M University. I did my undergrad and my MBA there. And while I was in my MBA program, anytime I would come back from internship, my then professor, who's now the Dean of the School of Business at FAMU, Dr. Friday Stroud, she said, you always have questions. You never like being on internship and you always have questions and you wanna be the boss. And, but you have a really good questions, right? So have you thought about getting your PhD? I was like, I did not come to college, to the business school of FAMU to be a teacher. Like I wanna be CEO of Fortune 500 company, right? All of us early 90s kids, you know, going, uh, late 90s kids going to college. We were ready to lead, but she said, there's more to getting a PhD than just being a teacher, right? At two o'clock on a Tuesday, Thursday. And so she said, why don't you follow an apprentice, myself and some of the other professors, and you'll see the things we do in consulting. You'll see when we're working with businesses, you'll see the research that we're working on. And I did that my whole MBA program. And so I decided after that, that I did want to get my PhD so that I could what? find the answers to the issues of diversity, race, and gender. So my whole career has been rooted in this. I've been very passionate. And just like now in 2021, people still say, oh, as a black woman, be careful just getting labeled as the diversity and inclusion person. When I was getting my PhD, people said the same thing. And this is in 2003, 2004. Oh, don't be the black woman studying race and gender. And so it was always seen as this like, be careful. And I'm like, why is everybody so scared? Now what I understand is that I think the world was just scared of the solution, right? And the more of us that saw that we could impact that, I think it, you know, it challenged, it challenged the space. So I went from there to getting my PhD and then going into academia. So I taught at Florida A&M University, Florida State University, Northeastern University, all over the place. But during that time, I also was consulting with Fortune 500, Fortune 500 companies throughout the way. And so what I was realizing through that time is, okay, wait a second. There's something that I have that's different, right? And so when we're talking about authentic voice here, you know, the first set of years, I didn't necessarily like have the, I'm not gonna say the confidence, but just I wouldn't have vocally said that out loud that way. But when you work in a space for a long time, you get feedback from the world that tells you what your skill sets are, right? And I knew that I had a secret sauce to doing diversity and inclusion work that was making me get clients above some of the other larger consulting companies. That's like a one woman show professor from FAMU, you know? And I'm like, there's a reason. And what I now know the reason is, which guides even my work now that I'm here at Moet Hennessy, is it's about learning and education. So at the core, I'm very clear, no matter what title I have, I'm an educator. And when the opportunity came for me to work with Moet Hennessy as their head of DNI for North America, the CEO was very clear about him valuing my learning and education background and allowed me to walk in my gift in that here, right? Um, a lot of times when we get into these roles, you know, the company already has a vision for what it looks like. And I'm blessed to be somewhere where the, the inaugural role was built to my skill set, 
And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of the impact that we're having now. So just for everyone that's, you know, on the emerging leader side, trying to find your way, like keep up with your secret sauce because the right place will want to taste it. So. I love that. I love that, Atira. And I love that you were basically recognized. Your brand was basically recognized because you stay true to your own authentic self and what you wanted to do with education and DEI. Mm -hmm. I love that. And that takes me into this question of what does an authentic voice mean to you and why does it matter? Sharika, we'll start with you. Yeah. Um, I, when I think about authenticity in my voice, there is a quote that I often go to. Um, as my older sister says, I not only love a good quote, I try to live a good quote. And there's a quote by uh, Maya Angelou that says, I do my best because I'm counting on you, counting on me. And what that means for me is that the more I show up in the full authenticity of who Sharika is, the more it creates space, permission, and empowerment for others to show up in her, his, or their own unique voice. I've recognized that it is extremely important for me to be very clear about my superpowers and to be very unapologetic in what those superpowers are and how I choose to use them within an organization. Um, we each are created in a uniqueness and that unique voice, perspective, insight, and those experiences, everything that makes us sort of the total sum of who we are. As an organization, as you find an organization that is prepared and ready to utilize those superpowers, you are able to drive for impact, to drive for change. And there's plenty of research that really speaks to the amount of wasted energy that we have when we sort of hide and I'll speak to a terrorist work when we wear the mask that really sort of covers up the who we are harnessing that power and not being afraid of showing my authenticity and taking my mask off has been a changer for me when I think about my image my brand but I also think about it and this was referred to earlier in the conversation from that perspective of the pie model I know that for me, many decisions that are impacting me, they are being made when sometimes I'm not even in the room. So for me, it's really important that my performance, that my image, and that my exposure, that I've been really deliberate about making sure I'm excelling in my work. Because every time you walk in a door and whatever dimension that you bring with you, you're either having the opportunity to destroy, reshape, rebuild stereotypes and biases that others have, or create sort of a whole new paradigm of understanding. So I'm very confident in focusing on my work, focusing on my image, who I am, and making sure that aligns with how I show up. And then also making sure that others are very aware of the story of Sharika, as I like to say, so that when I'm not in those rooms, that the right narrative that others are speaking on my behalf is in alignment with the truth of who I am. And I think when you are able to harness that, that gives you a power over your brand and your image, both inside the room, as well as when you're not. Oh, I absolutely love that. I love that, Sharika. I love that alignment. That alignment with your voice and your narrative is that brand. That's literally mm -hmm. that brand recognition. I love that. So how do we do this? I mean, this is fantastic. We got a, a kind of a, a clear um, approach of what authenticity means, but how do black women remain authentic to who they are while also making sure that there's a balance between that and fitting in with a company culture and brand? How do we keep strike that balance? Atira, we'll start with you. Okay, you know, one of the things and you know, Sharika referenced it, I built I say my public figure um, brand through my work on the art of unmasking. What I noticed was as I was, whether I was teaching women of color, whether I was consulting, whether I was speaking, every time after I finished speaking, some woman of color would come to me and be like, Dr. Charles, can I talk to you for a sec? Can I talk to you for a sec? And I'd be like, yes, you know? She's like, she would tell me a story. And what I said was, you know what? We have to start to capture these narratives. And so I 
part of something called the Mask Project, which basically started collecting narratives of women of color um, who were experiencing this, this, this hiding, this concealing that we felt the need to do, even when speaking to each other. There was power in that whisper because it was saying, sister, I, I trust you, but I don't even trust this conference hallway <laughs> to even tell this story. And so when we think about what authenticity means and what it is, it really does come down to authenticity gets better at. Because I think a lot of times there's this idea of I'm going to bring my whole entire self to the table. Mm, no, not a good idea, right? Authenticity isn't about bringing 1000% of yourself to the table. It's about having a piece about the different parts of yourself that you present in any situation, right? Because there's certain social environments you present a certain self, certain interactions, certain moments, and, and that's okay. When people get the anxiety and the distress, is when they're revealing and showing parts of themselves that are not true to who they are, right? So there's nothing wrong with switching it up, changing it up, but at least the parts you're switching to and changing to have to be you, right? So and it, right, it has to be a part of who you are. Like I'm a loud, candor-filled, straight talker, right? When I first, from New York, when I first started doing consulting, a sister came and pulled me to the side. She said, I don't know how you do what you do as straightforward as you do it. And I said, it's because I'm me and people trust me, mm -hmm. right? People can hear truth through trust. Mm -hmm. A lot of this work of presenting your authentic self is building trust so that people can hear your truth. But what tends to happen is we wear these masks that hide and conceal and it doesn't allow our authentic self out. So guess what? They don't know who we are either. Let's just call it what it is. If we're wearing all these masks, they can't connect in a line, as Sharika said, with who we are if we're presenting a false sense. So the energy will always tell the story. So as women of color, as Black women, I think we have to also, while we're pushing for inclusion from organizations, we have to make sure we're not self-excluding by not being ourselves, right? And leaning out away from our authentic place. Because I tell people, it's easy to do the work I do because I'm a tear in every space, every lane I'm at. So I don't have to, I don't get stressed out switching it up, mm -hmm. right? And I think we all have to get to a place where we have less to switch up. I love that, Atira. And, and I've really been having the conversation of moving organizations from talking about bringing your whole authentic self to the organization because that's not the reality, right? Instead, how do we focus on bringing the version of yourself that you feel most comfortable sharing with an organization and with others? Because the version of Sharika that I may be between nine to five it may not be the same version that shows up with my family or with members of my inner circle. And that is okay, because to your point, they are all still versions of the true Sharika. I love that. I love that so much. And, you know, I think it's really important as we're talking to the decision makers that are attending right now on our call as well is, is, is to, to express to them, what can they do? What can they do to ensure that black women are empowered when they're coming into the workplace and as leaders to express their unique authentic voice and be recognized for that brand more effectively? We'll start with you, Sharika. Yeah, um, and so I'm going to take uh, a traditional Sharika approach to this and answer a yes and to this. Okay. So the first part I'll speak to would be decision makers. Um, and I sort of the simple words I have are get out of the way. And what I mean by that is we think about um, creating access to decision making. We think about changing the systems from how we bring talent into an organization to how we promote talent to our compensation practices. We think about how we are developing talent, how we are creating opportunities for access and visibility and owning P&Ls within an organization for Black women. How are we creating, moving away from the mentorship to the true sponsorship and advocacy for Black women? How do you get out of the way of the change and the systemic change that needs to occur and focusing on not only what you need to bring or add to an organization, but also what you have to give up. 
because when we think about sort of that three-legged stool of power position and privilege, it is human nature to want to protect those things that keep us comfortable. But we know on the other side of that protection, on the other side of that comfort, that's where the change is really going to happen so that this norm around authenticity and the ability for Black women to speak our truths and speak our truths loudly, that's where that will occur. And then my and to that, and I speak to just Black women, is simply that, continue to speak your truths and do it loudly. Hiding behind a mask, shading away from that true and authenticity of your voice, your experience, and those superpowers that you have, do no justice to yourself, to an organization, or to the others that are looking at you as role models as they continue to rise up the ladders that we have had access to. For sure, and you know, oh, go ahead, so sorry. No, go ahead, please, I love it. Just go ahead, it's okay. here. <laughs> um, so when I think about, you know, cause people ask me the question, wait, you're leaving academia, you're leaving your own consulting business to go internal to a company? Like, huh, what, why, right? Um, and the reason that I did was because there was a certain set of things that existed at Moet Hennessy that said, if I'm going to take that step, this is where I'm going to take it at because I see certain things. So the first one is trust. And we talked about that already. I knew that the CEO and senior leadership team trusted me to do what I needed to do. So these are the things leaders need to do for the black women in this space. Give us resources. We can't make black girl magic with no black girl resources, right? So when I knew I was joining an organization that was going to give me the resources I needed to do the job, I said, okay, bet, I'm there. Um, and then also give us autonomy. Yes. We already know there's walls that exist for us. You already know there's biases that are working against us. Structure our roles with some autonomy so we could just buckle down and do the work, okay, with less walls. Then also leaders, especially our white male leaders, give us some of your social capital. Give the black women leaders in your space the, the armor that when they're interacting in the organization with people who may not be as ready as you, that you have their back, right? That, you know, oh, well, the CEO supports it. Look, I mean, I don't mean I get it, but hey, he has a back, so, right? That also helps get the work done. And then don't have black women leaders sitting up there by themselves all the time. Hire more. I think that we get real comfortable with just having one and then it's like, oh, well, we did that, check. No, give the support. And I don't care what space we're in, education, business, community, church, sorority life, anywhere. Black women thrive with Black women. It's a sisterhood and a support we learn from the preschool playground. And so for organizations to be successful with Black women, Black women have to see themselves. And guess what? It can get super lonely at the top. I'm really blessed to be on an executive leadership team with another Black woman, Jasmine Allen, who was just recently promoted to senior vice president of Hennessy. She runs the whole Hennessy team, y'all, like the whole thing. She's the first senior vice president, Black woman at the company. And seeing her face on a Zoom makes me smile. Mm -hmm. And I say that unapologetically. You know, I'll say that internal to the company, actually, do I do pretty often, right? It matters to see and know that you have someone there right, that understands all the levels with you as you're navigating. Um, so those would be the things I would tell leaders to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Atira and Sharika. I know we are over time, but I just want to let you know that this was incredibly valuable for all of our um, listeners here attending, and we truly appreciated your experiences and advice, and I appreciated your time. Thank you. Thank you. So this is uh, a conclusion of our first episode of Elevating Black Women in Business from Yardstick Management's DEI in Action series. We want to thank all of our panelists and all of our viewers for joining us today for our inaugural event. Please go to yardstickmanagement.com and subscribe for more news and follow us on social media for continuous updates on upcoming future events. Let us know what you think by writing to us directly. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, be well and stay in touch. She says she really grew up poor like me. Don't believe in nothing but the Almighty.